Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and get, add to what's uh, already helped my discussion. So a number of things I'll uh, uh, change over as I go through this a bit because some things have, uh, have been covered. Um, so I have no disclosures, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, we all know what we're focused on in terms of the Chiari malformation, and uh, the in fact, I'm gonna take this off. the um, the involvement of our understanding and our relationship with patients over the last 20 years has evolved very dramatically based on the importance of imaging, and uh, perhaps in the long run, the focus has been a little bit too great on the. Uh, nature of the tonsillar descent alone and probably have gotten farther away from the complexity of what the presentation of tonsillar herniation is really all about. In fact, few people uh, realize that uh, Chiari, when he des described the initial patients with tonsillar descent, was really describing a group of six patients with, uh, with uh, hydrocephalus who had secondary tonsillar descent. So the objectives of what I tr try to focus on today is a shift in our conceptual focus, not just my suggestion, but what's evolved over the last 10 or 15 years of the concerted efforts of patient groups and physicians working together, is uh, a trial thinking about a hindbrain herniation rather than simply just what the position of the tonsils are in the foramen magnum. Try to summarize some of the pathophysiologic mechanisms underlying hindbrain herniation, and that's already been done, and uh, I think you're moving away fairly quickly along the timeline of understanding better what the, some of these mechanisms are, as the previous speakers have alluded to. I'll suggest some algorithms for exploring these potential mechanisms in a clinical examination and testing of patients, because that's one area where we've made a lot of headway. I'm sorry to say more in the neurosurgical venue than in the neuro neurology uh, venue. If you uh, talk about uh, a neurologist, general neurologist, speaking on the basis of his uh, experience with uh, um, the academic exposure to Chiari and the like would say that the uh, Chiari patient is someone who has downbeat nystagmus, who has ataxia, and significant cough headache, which is a really a, just a slight headache produced by a, an intense or intense headache produced by a slight cough, which not really too many patients have. Well, uh, they have more other effort-related, strain-related, and uh, 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 kind of headache, which is maybe not gotten that, and as well as headache provoked by, by laughing, which many people find very peculiar. Um, so when you go back and look at that, that's what's in the textbooks of neurology, and that's what you're dealing with when you're talking to a lot of neurologists out there who really don't see many uh, Chiari patients. Frankly, I think the average neurologist probably sees one or two Chiari patients in his, in his working experience. The path of funneling these patients goes through the neurosurgical venue because surgery is always a consideration. So neurologists really don't have much experience with this, so it's, it, we need to educate them, but it's, it's not exactly a fault to fault them for not knowing more about it, but uh, it, it's a problem, and it's a problem that, uh, that we all face together, and, and we're gradually solving, I think. That we're, we're making some headway. The, um, um, We'd like to support the development of treatment objectives, recognizing and addressing these kinds of principles, because it's not simply uh, what is a Chiari malformation and what is, what is, is there a, the question came up as to whether there's some kind of uh, a stereotype procedure or surgical management that might, that might be helpful, and we're really not going to, uh, we're really not gonna get there because of the diverse mechanisms by which patients are affected by this problem in, in a global sense. So we talk about diagnostic methodology just to understand some of the terminologies, the systems of, a system of methods used in clinical problem solving, and algorithms are lists or processes or sets of steps that we can follow to help define these uh, and, and uh, solve these problems. Many of you may be uh, familiar with Atal Gawande, who's an, actually a neurosurgeon. He writes for the New Yorker magazine, and one of his books uh, that has made a striking success is called The Checklist Manifesto, and how, and <clears throat> how impressive the 
use of chest looks or reminders or uh, rules of thumb have been uh, helpful in, in approaching problems. And we need to apply this certainly in, uh, in Chiari, not to miss uh, uh, things that uh, we uh, maybe uh, not be obvious. So uh, it, when you come to the meeting like this, you think that, it, well, it's the patient that was the only one with the problem. Well, it's not exactly the case. <laughs> In order to solve your problem, physicians have to have a clear conceptualization of what that problem is. And that's kind of where the, where the problem is. Uh, either through education, or experience, they have to have seen it before. As I told you with neurologists, we're lucky if the average neurologist has seen one or two syringomyelia or Chiari patients his whole uh, professional career. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an issue. And what they learn in the textbooks has got nothing to do with what you all experience and what's actually out there, more in, this, in the neurosurgical community. And uh, physicians really learn by sort of a gestalt sort of method. You, you see things and you uh, live through experiences with patients, and you only really learn to see what you're looking for. Uh, we see this repeatedly in, uh, in radiological evaluations of patients where for years, uh, years ago, we used to see one centimeter, 15, one, uh, one uh, centimeter, 10 millimeter, 15 millimeter tonsillar descent, and these would not be read out by radiologists who, uh, who obviously just weren't looking for Chiari malformations or didn't think they, they were important. Um, so this is where the physician clearly has a problem, and I, I speak in terms more of specifically of neurologists, but extends to other caregivers, general practitioners, rheumatologists, and the like. Patients don't come with labels. We learn about identifying and labeling patients, but that's kind of after the fact. That's after the experience and the diagnostic process extends. But when the patient comes uh, looking for help, and uh, they uh, don't present in a way that's obvious to physicians, they're really at a loss to get the appropriate care. And so uh, the patient has this problem. He's evaluated by at least five or six physicians. At least one of them is probably a psychiatrist, all right? Uh, and uh, more often than not, it's a woman or a girl because we know Chiari on average is about three to one uh, females to males. Uh, the age of onset's quite variable, so we're used to categorizing certain diseases by when they occur. They're pediatric diseases, they're diseases of aging, they're uh, trauma, they're whatever related. But uh, a disease, a disorder like Chiari that presents, you know, at five years old, it presents at infancy, it presents at 80, which was our, I think our oldest surgical patient was 85 years old, who'd been symptomatic for a few years. Uh, so that's a little bit hard to grasp. How do you hang on to that? The symptom onset may be sudden uh, or maybe chronic, and it's often multiple kinds of symptoms. So you know, if you go to the physician, you have one symptom, you know, you've got a medical problem. If you have two or three symptoms, you know, you're a little bit uh, uh, um, hypochondriacal or hysterical. If you have four or five problems, you're, you're neurotic and ought to see a psychiatrist. So uh, it's, uh, it, that's kind of the, uh, the glazed over feeling I'm sure many of you have seen in physicians' faces when you start talking about myriad symptoms. And they say, okay, well, you know, this is, we just really can't cope with this, you know. Uh, and to boot, from a, even from a neurology standpoint, the underlying condition to the neurologist is relatively rare. They're darn sure they've probably never seen one of these, you know. And that goes uh, for our family friend, EDS, which we've really just learned an awful lot uh, about in the last five or six years in the general medical, not to mention neurology, but in the general medical community, and particularly even among rheumatologists who uh, we have difficulty in encouraging to see patients with connective tissue disease, although you think they would be interested in that. You know. the, um, so our problem in educating physicians, they have at some point been taught the common presentations of problems so that they have this gestalt feeling for the disorder. You've seen one. You know how to, you know, nobody has to, it's hard to describe. What's the difference between a, a palomino and a, 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 a donkey? and a zebra, all right? I mean, we, we kind of know what that is, but you have to see one to know what it is. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's this gestalt idea of how you differentiate patients that come through. Uh, they must understand how the component symptoms are linked together. 
When you have multiple symptoms, if you can't link them together, the physician is trying to link symptoms together, you know, uh, to try to get a unified uh, diagnostic uh, approach. And they, they have difficulty in this particular group, this particular set of disorders, because the symptoms are so diverse for, for reasons that if you understand the pathophysiology of it, become clear. But on the surface, it's, it's uh, elusive. The possibility that the disorder may be present at least has to come into the mind so they can begin to do this, uh, uh, this process we call differential diagnosis. They can kind of try to rule things in and rule things out rather than just reject the hypothesis or say this is a psychiatric problem or this is, you know, uh, uh, something I, I really have no idea, I can't uh, help you. And it's particularly aggravated by the fact that, uh, <clears throat> which came out through uh, Patrice last night, was saying, you know, many patients don't have a lot to show for their symptoms. In fact, 99% of the patients that I examine, over thousands of carry patients, have really very little on their physical exam to show for it. They uh, look perfectly fine. Uh, <clears throat> We talked about some of the visual symptoms, and I think, uh, as I've said before, a mild degree of tandem instability, the ability to stand with one foot in front of the other, is often the, the simplest, uh, single, uh, subtlest kind of sign that you see, and a funny kind of difficulty with this visual orientation that uh, uh, the uh, previous neurologist talked about, which is related to these psychotic eye movements that are very difficult unless you do electron nystagmography and have somebody sophisticated look, look at how these psychotic movements and how the eye movement system transitions from perso slow pursuit movements to uh, rapid, staggering, jumping eye movements. And pat patients in particular uh, describe, a, uh, and you can show, give me a show of hands if anybody's experienced this, a lot of people have difficulty going down. If you shop in a, in a supermarket, going down a line when, when you're distracted by items on the left and right. So when they try to go, and they get particularly disoriented walking down aisles because their eyes are caught by all the sign, and they just can't handle that eye movement makes them disoriented. Anybody ever have that experience? Yes. So a fair number. That's a, it's a uh, vague, very un dis uh, disturbing kind of, an unsettling kind of symptom. And uh, it's very deep-seated and probably related to the function of the brainstem and, and, uh, and uh, tonsillar associations. And it, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't get very much better with uh, um, surgery uh, as, for instance, the headache symptom. Uh, so that's um, one thing. So what is one of the aspects of this problem is what I call the blind men and the elephant issue. You have all these physicians looking on in, in consternation at what this, uh, what this uh, problem may be. And it looks like migraine to the headache people. To the ENT people, it looks like a Meniere's kind of disease. There's not a very good specific way to diagnose this. Uh, General internists think, and rheumatologists think about chronic fatigue syndrome, POTS, and neurally mediated hypotension. Uh, a large number of people get put into endocrine looks for growth hormone and thyroid abnormalities, which need to be looked at probably because some of the, the fatigue and cognitive symptoms, but those things usually come up negative. Multiple sclerosis we frequently see is what starts some of the involvement that identifies the Chiari malformation if you're lucky uh, and, they, and they actually mention it. Or they may say, which I'm, all of, uh, many of you I'm sure are too familiar with, well, you have a Chiari malformation, but it's got nothing to do with your symptoms. Uh, so, and then uh, all you have to do is talk to someone with, uh, with a long history of seeing physicians without much benefit, and they all will be depressed and anxious for obvious reasons because the physicians don't, don't seem to have any understanding of what might be going on with you. So uh, that's very, uh, you know, it's very disturbing. And unfortunately, what it leads to is for patients to elaborate on their symptoms, to kind of go the extra mile to prove to the next physician that they're really, you got to take me seriously. And that proves to the last physician that you're really, this is really a psychoneurotic problem because, you know, this is over, really, the symptoms are overblown. And then they don't accept you one way or the other. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. And then there's this um, 
association with uh, uh, a disease. At least we have Chiari, which we can identify, we know how to treat, but we have a disorder here called fibromyalgia that occupies about 35% of the rheumatology practices. Uh, uh, not that they want to see any of these patients because they don't know what to do with the pain and they don't know what to do with the disability. But when we compare symptom for symptom, many patients are, I'm sure, how many people have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia in the crowd? You know, that's, it's, you have pain, you have uh, achiness, you have a little headache, and you, um, uh, you look like fibromyalgia, and there's uh, then uh, the physicians kind of want to distance themselves because they're not sure how to treat that, and they don't want to give you narcotic medications. Uh, so what are, what are the barriers here uh, to this, uh, approaching this problem? Well, uh, it can present like this either uh, suddenly or insidiously, we talked about, but also the bugaboo here is that about 25% of patients get worse following trauma. So, aha, you know, these could be patients that have secondary gain and are trying to have some kind of litiginous uh, involvement, and that steers physicians, backs physicians off a lot. We know from uh, the uh, 1999 paper, about 25% of patients with Chiari had cervical, neck, and headache pain, uh, following a uh, minor to um, some, sometimes major craniocervical injury, usually a, a whiplash injury. And this has really upped the ante with all the texting because I must see once or twice a month I see two carry pa patients coming back in having been rear-ended at 20 miles an hour by somebody that was texting. Uh, and uh, multi, uh, it's multi-symptomatic, uh, including pain and fatigue, and uh, it's often confused with these, all these psychiatric issues. You know. uh, also on the physician side, uh, to their, uh, in their defense somewhat, is physicians learn about the worst case presentation. So what they learned about Chiari in medical school was dissociated sensory loss, which might be related to a syrinx, which you frequently don't even see, even if you have a syrinx, uh, and downbeat nystagmus and cough headache, which, uh, you know, talking about the downbeat nystagmus, this eye movement abnormality that was talked about earlier is very frequent. But downbeat nystagmus, I count on my two hands probably the number of people we've seen with really obvious and, uh, you know, at the bedside discernible severe downbeat nystagmus who had severe brainstem uh, compression. So most patients, that's the tip of the iceberg that was reported 25 years ago when it got into textbooks, but now the spectrum of patients we see is totally different. Um, and uh, most common and often only physical finding is this unsteadiness in tandem or these subtle eye movements. So there's not really much to encourage a physician to say, hey, there's really something going on here. They're used to seeing, you know, something uh, that they can uh, uh, get their hands on, and so they're uh, at a loss. Uh, and disorders like this ri arise in, in awareness to the extent that there are treatments available. And in the neurology community, they're often driven by pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical companies. And neurologists are inundated by the Parkinson's treatments, the headache, the headache center treatments with Botox and tryptans, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry drives that. There's much less of this uh, in the neurosurgical community, uh, but this is what uh, you know neurologists are bombarded with. So if they can't really, they really aggressively, they're anxious to treat you, but they don't know what to treat you with, and if they can't, you know, identify this as a migraine or or a, other kind of problem that they're more familiar with, they, uh, they're ready to jettison the patient, you know. So education, as other people have said, is a slow process, you know. Uh, traditional textbooks aided by now the electronic age, but are still about 10 years behind the times. And uh, diagnostic tests, still we're arguing about what's tonsillar descent and what are, you know, it always helps in a disease if you can do a genetic test or you can do a blood test and say, oh, this is present in a high degree of uh, assurance in 95% of patients. And that really helps. We don't have that. And part of the problem is we're not dealing with one disorder. We're dealing with uh, uh, a host of problems that have to be sorted out and are, are really fairly complex. So what's the solution? Well, this is what we're here about, right? It's physician education. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't, we're speaking to the um, 
the converted here, you know, we don't get, attract enough physicians to some of these groups. The neurosurgeons are much better at this uh, in their national meetings. Neurologists, I, we tried uh, with a group, uh, a group of us uh, for about four years to get on the educational program in the American Academy of Neurology, which speaks to about 25,000 neurologists across the United States, and we couldn't even get a three-hour program on the, uh, on the meeting because it was, uh, you know, the, the migraine people just didn't think it was, thought it was so rare, they didn't think it was very interesting, and the spine people really had their own agenda. Uh, and it was, we did for, for about three years, and uh, we just didn't have any, any takers. Uh, I think we probably have to make another go of it. We actually had a petition from one of the support groups of patients saying neurologists were uniformly uneducated about this, and they didn't really even respond to it. So it's a sad situation, I'm sorry to say, from that prof our professional group. Uh, we have a, a, a clothing a retailer in the New York area that says, an educated consumer is our best customer, Cy Sims. And that's one thing we can do. We can, get, we can talk in these meetings. I, can, I feel I can make more of an effort making you educated about this, so hopefully you can, you can probe your neurologist and get them a little interested. Once they get interested, neurologists are very interested in rare things, and as, once they pique their interest, you, know, you really can have some uh, go ahead with them and get them involved, but uh, it's been slow in coming. And patient-driven advocacy, you know, get out there, spread the word, make people understand what's going on. While we still, through research, try to identify better diagnostic techniques, better treatment methods, um, and, uh, you know, uh, genetic uh, approaches to this that will, I'm sure, going to bear fruit in the future. From a historical perspective, our knowledge and understanding is, cl is clearly improving. Uh, I've been doing this for about, uh, about 20 years, and... Uh, some of this led to a, a study, really, uh, in retrospect, a very nice study that Dr. Millerat uh, produced, which, which uh, it really talked about, a lot, the biggest group of uh, carry patients put together talked about a lot of the, the redefined, the symptomatology, which is still trying to filter down through uh, people to help them recognize what the problems are. We started with some rudimentary morphometrics in the posterior fossa, got an idea that there could be, uh, you know, we, could, we can measure some things and we could find out uh, that the posterior fossa was small and that this was reproducible and it helped categorize patients. Um, the Chiari symptom list again shows part of the problem, occipital headache kind of leads the list, but there are really so many symptoms here that the neurologist's eyes glaze over, ocular disturbances, uh, uh, acoustic and vestibular complaints, numbness and tingling, chronic fatigue, bulbar and coordination problems, pain, impaired memory, concentration, cervical spine. You know, their eyes get glassy. Where, where, do, we, where do we start? You know, and uh, so uh, when we got involved in this and we, we were, Dr. Millerat became interested in why does Chiari surgery fail a lot of the time? We just heard Dr. Heiss say that, you know, pain doesn't get better, function maybe gets better. Uh, we still have to maybe add a lot of patients to that list, but, you know, um, why doesn't the surgery work? And one of the obvious questions, well, you know, how are we treating, uh, are we treating the same disease? Uh, are these, you know, if you, if you treat mumps, measles, and uh, pneumonia with the same antibiotic, you're gonna get different results. So you really have to separate out those things and know what your treatment is, if it's got a chance of, of being um, uh, uh, profitable. And so the question, and believe me, uh, there was a little bit of confusion. I mean, people recognize hydrocephalus can depress the tonsils, but we've come a long way in kind of understanding a number of things, EDS, uh, pseudotumor problems, tethered cord syndrome, uh, the influence of trauma on some of these patients. So it, it's getting there. But in a look at, a, at about 380 cases back in, in, the, in a, uh, 2002 to 2004, and patients that had had surgery but you know really weren't doing well, and they were saying, well, what, do I need another surgery? So some of them probably here, largest group, probably had inadequate decompressions. They may have not had tonsillar shrinkage. They may not have had a duraplasty. Again, there's so many variables in the operation. But these, were prob these look to be inadequate because largely if you uh, would give them an adequate decompression, the syrinx would collapse. And was part of that contribution, as Dr. Heiss mentioned, to people stop stopping doing the syrinx shunts at the time of their decompression because we found a better way. 
uh, <coughs> pseudomeninga seals, in many surgeons' hands, reports are upwards of figures of 15% 15, 15 of patients have complicated fluid collections. And um, this can be a little bit of a problem. Sometimes it need, needs to be surgically, uh, surgically corrected because a mass of fluid behind your head is just, you can't compress fluid, you compress air. You can't compress fluid, it's like a rock back there. You know, it can be obstructing that, that, uh, that area. I think we found that chronically raised intracranial pressure, which neurologists and neurosurgeons kind of tended away from looking at because of the tonsillar descent, but when you really looked at post-op patients, we, I was uh, <laughs> from the neurology school where you, know, you got in in the morning, the attending wanted to know what the LP showed. It didn't matter whether the patient had incontinence or whatever, you just had to have done the LP. And uh, so we did tons of spinal taps, and we always had a lot of information on the patient. And so we started looking more, and we found that Patients, a lot of patients had increased intracranial pressure. They didn't have really classical pseudotumor pressures of greater than 25 centimeters, uh, which generally neurologists and the whole pseudotumor group, which is some neurologists, some ophthalmologists who are trying to protect people from going blind from optic nerve changes from in increased intracranial pressure. <clears throat> but uh, this was clearly a problem. We began to see a number of patients who had repeated leaks who actually had increased pressure. It was a 200 to 25 millimeters. And, uh, you know, if you uh, did a lumbar drain or something, you decreased the pressure, you, you could get the ceiling back and, uh, and maybe uh, avert the problem with uh, pseudomeninga seals. So we began to pay a lot more attention to this idea of pseudotumor and how do you assess it. And there's a lot of uh, things going on now in terms of non-invasive ways like optical coherence tomography and maybe some imaging techniques that may help us try to get at the intracranial pressure without doing a spinal tap or putting a probe into the, into the cerebral hemisphere. Uh, really, in the last four or five years, I mean, we began, and I think Dr. Bolognese, give him credit for this, because he began, we, when we began to see these patients, we were seeing, we had some relationship with uh, Dr. Frank Amano because of a few patients, and uh, we began to see like probably 10% of our practice was patients that were hypermobile. And, uh, you know, that's a, considered a pretty rare disease, and if you get Chiari is a rare disease and hypermobility is a rare disease, the combination ought to be very rare. But here it was. It was 10 or 15% of the patients we were seeing, you know. And that sort of rang bells, and we started looking at that, getting, uh, you know, getting Marcy and, and Allison more involved in, in some of this. So, um, and that's still moving along, and we know how to identify this a lot better, and we know how to treat it more aggressively. We saw many patients who had had, as one of the cases that was mentioned in discussion, had a posterior fossa decompression and got got worse. This was one of the stories, I think, that piqued Dr. Bolognese's interest. You know, here were these people coming in. They were worse. They had a decompression. Decompression looked great, but they were worse. What did they, they had, uh, uh, you know, we were measuring some of these things at that point, but it, it took putting the picture together to see that these people were just more unstable after they were, you know, had their ligamentous attachments loosened a little bit because of the surgical procedure that was thought to help them actually made them worse. You know, so those patients needed a hybrid or some other kind of surgical approach. Again, uh, not all surgery fits. You have to know what you're treating to know what the sur to anticipate or, or assess validly assess the surgical outcomes. And the surgical outcomes may be different. So we still saw Dr. Chiari's old patients, patients with hydrocephalus. You know. Uh, <clears throat> I remember one patient that we got from the Midwest, I think it was Vanderbilt or someplace, who had tonsillar descent, sure as suiting, she had no other symptoms. Uh, they'd done a cervical MRI to offer her surgery. When she came in, we did the usual, you know, we got a brain MRI, cervical lumbar. She had a, a fist-sized meningioma in her uh, parietal occipital cortex on the right side. It was a big silent lesion, but it was huge. It was beginning to cause some mass effect, and that was pushing her tonsils down. So you really have to look at all potential etiologies so you really know what you're treating. If you treated that patient with a decompression, probably make her worse because the tumor would maybe expand and make the, uh, the anatomical arrangements there even more uh, catastrophic. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> in, in the mid, uh, early part of the 2000s, there was a lot of uh, controversy about uh, fibromyalgia and Chiari, and some people even thought that really Chiari actually caused fibromyalgia. And when push came to shove and a lot of assessments were made, there was probably a co-occurrence of maybe 5% uh, or less, and it was probably that 
fibromyalgia is not a disease, it's just a symptom complex, and Chiari patients can look like they have fibromyalgia, just like uh, osteoarthritis patients uh, who have joint disease, an identified problem, have aches and pains, and they have hypersensitivity to tender points and that. But when you look at the commonality, you know, the fibromyalgia group shares a lot of the same, you know, they have multiple symptoms, uh, and a lot of the uh, same interaction issues with, with physicians. Um, this is one patient of ours who uh, uh, demonstrated in a very Im important fashion and interesting how we began to, you know, you look at some of these people and you sit them on the table and say, hi, how are you? And they look perfectly fine. But when you ask them to do some of these maneuvers, like backward handshake and uh, uh, be able to distract the shoulder, uh, hyperextend the, the distal limbs and, and uh, have this kind of flexibility, it's... Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So you see what this looks like? This is part of the Baton scoring technique. Uh, you can bring the thumb down to touch the forearm. That's uh, not, mo not everybody can do that. And hyperextending the pinky uh, past uh, 90 degrees. And as she does, she can dislocate her shoulders at will. Uh, <coughs> there you can see right there. It's able to bring it right out of the socket. And she could do the same thing with her hip, pop it out and, re, and uh, realign it. She doesn't back knee quite that much or hyperextend at the knee, but she's got a lot of patellar laxity. She can move the patella off, off the knee, exposing the medial part of the joint. Try this on for size. It's not, uh, very few people can do that, but she's extremely flexible there. <coughs> so, uh, as we approach this, we began, uh, you know, the part of the neurology approach to this and the medical approach to this was really looking at uh, and, and finding out ways, how, how do you get more sensitive at doing this? You ask people about their hypermobility, and when you ask them, they say, oh, you know, we do that when you get together for Christmas, mom, you know, my two sisters, you know, everybody sees what they can do. And, uh, and it, all of a sudden, it spills out, you know, they have mitral valve prolapse, they have had two or three dislocations, they couldn't play, uh, uh, you know, they couldn't play volleyball in high school because they dislocated this and that, and they had problems with torn rotator cuffs. Uh, they have malabsorption and gastrointestinal. Again, all this multiple symptomatology. They have poor wound healing. From the surgical standpoint, if you begin to think about surgical management of these, you've got to know about this. This is important because they don't heal well. The wounds dehiss, the wounds get infected, and um, and if you do a common ordinary, what you think is a common ordinary Chiari and you decompress them, chances are they're going to be worse if they have a lot of instability. So this is part of the, really, the neurological evaluation, the family history, bait and scoring, physical exam, looking for skin features. If you talk about, you know, the, the abundance of uh, stretch marks that, you know, you have a 14-year-old who's got stretch marks on the hips, on the breast, on the tummy, and that without a pregnancy intervening, you know, that's not, uh, that's not normal. And we do some bedside techniques, axial loading, pushing, seeing how sensitive patients are to loading the skull on the cervical spine and whether they get relief with extraction. Uh, this seems like a simple thing, but it's amazing how insightful it can be. Some people can't stand for you to put anything and touch their head, and they put a collar on them or a cervical thoracic orthotic, and their symptoms go away. We've even had people push down on them, they get, they get downbeat and nystagmus. You raise their head, it goes away. Uh, and that's, that's impressive when you see that even once. Uh, clinical testing, they, a lot of these people have laxity and pooling of blood in their lower extremity, so they get syncopal, but it's really not a cardiac syncope, so the cardiologists throw them out. They say, well, uh, some of them, I'll admit, some of them have had ablations, and they have, I don't know whether that's genetically associated in some way with the cardiac fibrous uh, connective tissue, but uh, many of them just uh, will have not immediate uh, volume depleted uh, syncope, but syncope on standing for 10 or 15 minutes. And their cardiac output is so low, they're just chronically fatigued. Uh, and they need to be medically managed. Uh, and they will do, with deconditioning, they will do worse in the post-op period for this as well, all right? So we need to do these measurements to look for cranial cervical instability, uh, basilar uh, impression, and uh, sometimes uh, stand-up MRI techniques may be helpful or in, even invasive uh, cervical traction. Here's a patient that uh, had uh, uh, connective tissue disease in the upright posture. Her tonsil is herniated. It's not while she lies down, and uh, she has a 
a, uh, uh, you know, a CXA below 135, indicating that she's angled uh, in, that, in that particular position. Here is a change from, uh, from uh, supine to sitting ang angle here of the clivus and the, and the odontoid gets worse. And when you extract her, you can pull her out uh, fairly, fairly well. So she's got laxity, and as, as Dr. Bolnese mentioned, you know, there's three ranges of motion, rotational, vertical, and horizontal. She's got problems in, in at least two, at least three, two of those. Um, and that culminated in this paper that Dr. Millerat and Dr. Bolognese were, were involved in. Um, so around 2007, uh, we used to talk about Chiari, and be, you have to understand that this, this tonsillar descent rule is not an absolute thing. Three, it used to be three to five millimeters, and that was, you know, it was a little bit of a, it was a, a, arbitrary to start with, but then the, even the, 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 uh, the variability was a little arbitrary. But I think work, uh, 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 work done uh, in the interim looking at uh, 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 children uh, and uh, also adult cases found that, you know, you can get really, in the, even in the adolescent population, get uh, tonsillar descent of four, maybe five millimeters, which may somewhat improve as time goes on. So we uh, are uh, not very aggressive with children if we can get them through to their adult and their skull and their cranial cervical proportions are fixed in, 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 in their full growth. Trying to, this educational point of view, we got together uh, with the CSF group and, uh, and did this list of 10. So these were symptoms which uh, we tried to populate out to physicians. You know, do you, do you really, how many, how many Chiari patients uh, do you have in your patient population? I you would usually challenge the medical guys and even the neurologists say, but there's three or four patients you're now taking care of that really have Chiari 1 malformation and you just don't know about it. And so, uh, you know, here's a bunch of questions you can kind of go at. These are patients, you know, that the incidence of these symptoms was more than 50% in, in a group of about uh, 900 patients that we, we looked at. And so, again, it points up this multiple symptomatology that gets the physician's eyes glazed over. So we tried over the years to um, look at uh, ways to monitor these patients, pain scales. Dr. Uh, Heiss talked about that, various kinds of morphometric measurements, and um, the uh, uh, you can see a little bit about what this Cine flow study is. I wanted to get this to continue to repeat, but there it goes. So you can see, again, that there's some decrease in posterior flow, and this became uh, an early uh, go-to kind of technique to look for s flow obstruction, but I think it's a little bit less used now because, uh, you know, really if you have uh, anatomical obstruction here, you don't get much flow. But still, for the patients, it has some place in patients with borderline tonsillar descent to see functionally whether they have some limitation of CSF movement, which is thought to be certainly part of the, part of the problem. Doctor, I won't belabor this. Dr. Bolnese uh, showed you the, the issues of uh, uh, looking at uh, these CT scan images. And uh, some of the patients uh, that have had very large decompressions cause problems uh, in terms of later fusion. Um, there was a, a, for, a, f, a foray into large decompressions for a while, hoping that if we decompressed above the sinuses, we might decrease intracranial pressure or venous obstruction, and that really didn't uh, prove to be an, a, a terribly effective strategy. Um, and I won't belabor that. You know, keeping your eyes open and just observing and having the benefit of, of the experience of taking care of patients personally and being involved in their care is what makes things happen a lot of the time. And, you know, we, we used to argue about what was cerebellar slumping. Was the cerebellum too heavy? Was the opening too big? And we had this patient, it was a perfect example of somebody that got decompressed, and you'd think the tonsils would get better and everything. Here, it looks worse. It looks like the whole cerebellum fell through here. But this was a patient uh, that had... Uh, that had uh, a tethered cord syndrome and after the surgery was uh, significantly better. And when you measure uh, frame and magnum opening, we are able to see that patients with synostosis, which the common form of Chiari with a small posterior fossa is very similar to. And the patients with tethered cord sometimes have a, a large frame and magnum suggesting that 
you know, tonsillar or cerebellar impaction through was a very early uh, in their evolution and their skeletal and brain growth. Um, so again, neurologically and medically, we tried to apply screening techniques to, to up our ante about looking for tethered cord syndrome. And how do you spot these patients? If you don't look for it, you're not going to see it. If you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to see it. You ask a patient, well, how do you pee? And they say, well, I, I pee great. I never have a problem peeing. And so how many times a day do you go? Well, I go 20 times a day and I go four times at night. I said, well, that's, you know, that's not normal. So let's look at that. You know, are you urgent? Well. You know, yeah, sure, I'm urgent, isn't everybody? Um, you know, so again, when you begin to look at this and how changes may go back into the, into the teenage years, you can find some important uh, aspects of this. Here's looking at this, uh, uh, the tethered cord is a patient that had a decompression, didn't do very well, had a section of the phylum terminale, and you can see that the brainstem uh, has been upwardly kind of mobile with release from, from below. Here's a patient, again, with tethered cord surgery that had uh, relief of a cervical syringomyelia without decompression. You have to only see that once or twice to say, really, uh, this really is something that is very likely meaningful. Here's a patient that had a tethered cord release with uh, a thoracic syrinx, uh, which we called at the time a terminal syrinx, and we got us, that got people into trouble because they thought it was a terminal illness, but it wasn't a terminal, it was just a distal syrinx. And here you see the syrinx collapsing at, uh, after six months after a section of the phylum terminale. And Dr. Millerat and Dr. Bolognese uh, talked about that in a very, very, <laughs> and still controversial paper. But we look for it, it's important to look for it, and if you don't look for it, you don't see it. If you don't do a thoracic MRI imaging, if you don't do a lumbosacral spine imaging at the get-go, which I, I still believe, although we don't see it always, patients should have full spinal imaging, just, uh, I mean, just to be sure you were there and you checked these things. Um, we do some phylum terminale traction tests, having the patient heel walk, stretching them, extending them, flexing them, uh, to see whether we can uh, cause any neurological symptoms on, on pulling on the tether, if that's possible. We do uh, urodynamic testing, which also oftentimes will show a, a neurogenic, neurogenic bladder. We certainly, a lot of these patients, what makes it controversial is a lot of these patients uh, don't have conus lying below the radiographic past standard of uh, the conus tip being below L23, but we, we see some of those. But predominant is a much uh, shadier area where patients have somewhat low-lying conuses. You can do a lumbo, lumbosacral spine prone. The radiologists don't like it because the films aren't too good, but see how mobile that tip of the conus is. Look for a cerebellar prolapse and certainly a thoracic syringomyelia, which is probably more likely associated with distal tethering than, than up, up uh, above uh, uh, obstruction at the frame and magnum. Scoliosis is associated. And look for other segmental abnormalities like occult spina bifida. You see this a fair amount and segmentation uh, abnormalities with uh, lumberization or sacralization. Uh, and uh, I just want to, in passing, we look at these patients that have had CSF leaks. And this is just an example of uh, CT uh, myelography showing leakage of CSF out here following uh, either trauma or uh, sometimes uh, spinal taps or multiple spinal taps. And the Im important issue of uh, 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 dural um, Effusions, which can be a, a signatory on a contrast MRI scan that the patient may have a CSF leak. It's probably one of the more rare things. I'll just go quickly through this issue of pseudotumor problems, but again, we look at fibromyalgia, Chiari, and pseudotumor. So many of the symptoms are overlapping, and uh, we need to look more, more carefully at patients, as Dr. Bolognese mentioned, that have Chiari, may have been surgical treated, and secondarily get pseudotumor. Uh, there are patients that have had meningitis or complications, or have, they just have, you know, maybe we shouldn't call it pseudotumor, that's a lousy name, but it's chronic, we used to call it CRIPS, chronically raised intracranial pressure. And you need to ask, you need to know it's part of the process because medications like uh, uh, methazolamide and acetazolamide can, in 40% of the patients or more, can be of significant, uh, significant relief. So here are the presenting symptoms with uh, pseudotumor, and there, you know, follows the path. You would uh, swear this might have been a carry patient. They usually don't have papilledema. It's very rare we see papilledema. This is what papilledema looks like, and uh, I look for it every single patient. Really uh, see sometimes flattening, which can come out on the OCT, but it's uh, really almost never, never seen. Uh, 
patulous duroplasty, sometimes this is a signatory. You know, usually these will shrink, and, and uh, when you see something like this, it's oftentimes associated with, uh, with intracranial pressure elevation. We can see cuffing around the optic nerve sheath, which uh, can be another sign of pseudotum. We're looking for ways to do this without doing a spinal tap, and uh, you can see uh, a tor tortuosity of the optic nerve, and then you can see thickening. Actually, you, on a good MRI scan, you can see the uh, uh, extension and protrusion of the optic nerve head into the, uh, into the canal. So, um, I think um, I'll stop uh, right there, and uh, maybe other questions will come up uh, in the general discussion, because this is really an hour's talk that kind of got slammed into 30 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs>